time to join in. Um, and then also, I just want to say from the get go that our hosting platform induces a lot of lag in the live stream. Um, so if you send a message in the chat and then it takes like, you know, 60 seconds for me to see that, just know that that's that reason. Um, yeah, we just have a lot of lag, but it's still going to be awesome. I'm really excited. Um, hope we get a decent amount of people. And I'm really excited to talk about rockets. Um, I will say again before you know we really get into things that you can submit questions and submit those at any time during the stream. Here is a here I'll put this in present mode and maybe make that yeah cool. Um, you can present questions. You can go through the Georgia Space Grant social media, um, and somebody will see that and relay it to me. Or you can go directly to my email and I'll see that as well. Or you can post them in the chat and I'll see those. We'll probably have a Q&A session kind of towards the end, um, just kind of due to the nature of the lag. So send your questions in the entire time. And then maybe towards the end, we'll have a Q&A where I kind of address one by one. Um, but yeah, um, if you guys notice, again, this is kind of a pilot program. Um, so we're definitely still trying things out. So if you have any tips or suggestions, throw those in the chat. Um, if you can't hear me very well, if you can't see me very well, or the presentation, just let me know, um, and we can address that. Oops. So yeah. Um, again, I'm gonna wait a little bit, so so let's more people join. Uh, if there's anybody out there who I know, feel free to, you know, send your name in the chat. Let me know you're out there, or say hello. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to teach you guys about rockets, talk about rockets. So. Dylan says quarantine beard, and yes, that is 100% a thing. So, yeah. Let me know what you guys think, yay or nay. I'm still figuring it out. Reese Alfred, hello, hey Reese. How are you? Casey says, what up? Hey Casey, how's California? Gonna open the stream on my computer over here. Cool. All right. So now we're we're gonna wait a couple more minutes. Um, just maybe till two o five. Just to let people come in. Again, feel free to submit any questions. Um, hello, Barbara. Nice to nice to see you. Ah, oh, thanks, Dylan. I appreciate that. I've had mixed reviews on it, but. So, cool. Nice. Hello, Deborah, and hello, Rivers. Thank you for joining. Um, for anybody kind of joining now, we're just going to give it a couple more minutes, and then we're going to get started. Um, so you can see over here, I have Sustain Alive is one rocket. Um, Okay, I just got a message from Space Grant. Thanks for being GSGC's first live stream. My pleasure, really enjoying it so far. Um, GT Aerospace Engineering said, okay, well, since that's an actual question, we'll save that till the end, maybe. All right, one more minute, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. And yeah, I am broadcasting from my bedroom. Uh, I'm still living in Atlanta, um, despite everybody going home. Um, so it's very lonely around here, but I've converted my bedroom into a makeshift studio, doing some little lighting tricks um, that you can't see kind of behind the camera. Have some rockets set up behind me that I'll kind of touch on later. All right, so it looks like it's 2.05, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, Again, this is how you can submit any questions. Submit any time throughout, and then we'll kind of address all the questions in the end. Cool. Um, and I'm gonna switch this. I'm gonna make myself really small. You guys don't need to see me, you need to see this. 
Cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. Real quick. Okay, so this is about rockets. This is the title slide. Um, I am Carson Corsi. I'll be talking to you guys today. And this is all through the Georgia Space Grant Consortium. Hello. Oh no, technical difficulties already. Ooh, let's, let's, okay, let's try that again. Okay, here we go. So just a little bit about me, not too much. The presentation's not about me. Um, I'm a second year aerospace engineering student at Georgia Tech. Um, I'm originally from Jefferson, Georgia, which is near Athens. So it's kind of funny that I ended up going to Tech instead of Georgia, T-H-W-G. Um, I'm very involved with the rocket teams on campus. Maybe you've guessed that um, with me being here to talk to you guys about rockets. And then just another cool thing I did in my time at Tech um, in the last two years, I was in the marching band and that was a really great time. And then quick shout out over here to my main rocket friends. Um, there are many rocket friends, but these are my main rocket friends, Rachel, Brophy, and Carson. So if they're watching, happy to, I miss you guys. Hope to see you soon. But anyway, enough, enough about me. Let's get into rockets, right? Cool. So first I'm going to talk real briefly, not really fast. It's not, again, it's not really what this is about, about the Spaceport America Cup team. That's kind of how I learned most of what I know about rockets. It connected with people who um, also love rockets. So it was a great social aspect. Um, we compete in a competition every year out in New Mexico. Um, last year was our first year and we flew this rocket right here, Sustain Alive. You can see you have, that's most of the rocket, but you know, it's 13 feet tall. My ceilings are not 13 feet tall. They're higher than average, but they're not 13 feet tall. So then the rest of it is right there. Um, so we flew that, did really, really well, um, had a great time. Um, we were in the 30,000 foot commercial off the shelf category. Um, and this year we're going to be in the student research category where, you know, and then it got canceled. But next year we're going to keep moving forward. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about that. Uh, great club. If anybody's interested in joining it, um, I'll definitely open to take questions about that at the end as well. And maybe I can say a little bit about that. But just wanted to give a quick blurb about that because a lot of what I know about Rockets, I owe to that club and the people in it and the experiences that I got from it. Cool. So then here are just a couple of pics um, from the launch. So there's the entire team last year in front of the rocket out in New Mexico. We were doing some presenting. Just again, just a really great time. Um, really looking forward to the next chance I get to launch a rocket like this. It's a whole lot of fun. So, okay, now it's why I'll talk about why you guys are here, right? You guys are here to learn about rockets, not hear me talk about myself and a rocket team at tech. So whenever I like to kind of break down rockets into like kind of like the base components, just for like utter simplicity, maybe people aren't super familiar with rockets, I kind of like to break it down like this. So you got the payload, that's why it's going somewhere, right? Why would you go somewhere without a payload? You got the controls, that's how does it know where it's going? You know, if it's not controlled, you know, it's just gonna go. How's it going to go where it wants to go? So, and then the third option or the third section is propulsion, and that's how does it go? So, really excited to kind of talk to you guys about this. And then, if you'll see, I have a Saturn V down here. But I also, let me do this real quick. Ooh, where's my mouse? There it is. We'll do this. Then you'll see, I also have a Saturn V right here. Boom. So let me switch this. Cool. So now I'm big. Um, so if you think about the three kind of things I just mentioned to you, right? Um, this is a Saturn V Lego. It's a ton of fun. Definitely get one. Uh, it's 110, 1 to 110 scale. So the original, the actual Saturn V is 363 feet tall. This is way smaller than that, obviously. This is one meter tall. Um, but I just kind of want to mention so you have the three. You know, three sections, right? Three major components. And of this entire rocket, you know, this much is the payload, right? So very small amount relative to the actual, the actual rocket. And this little black stripe, that's the controls. So even a smaller amount 
even though it's very essential. You know, this is payload and controls, very essential to the mission of any rocket, but very small proportionally to the rest of the rocket. So the rest of this entire thing, so from this upper black stripe down, is going to be the propulsion. That's how it's going, right? So you'll notice that that's, that seems kind of strange, right? Like this is why the rocket's going and how it's going, but this is, or how does it know where it's going? And then this is, how is it actually going? So we'll talk more maybe about that a little later, but I just want to point that out for now. And that's the same for a lot of rockets. Most of the mass um, percent wise will definitely be, you know, related to propulsion. Um, so we'll talk about that later. Let's set this back over here. And I'm going to throw the presentation back up there. Cool. All right. So now let's get into it. So payload, why is it going? So payload can range um, from all different kinds of things, right? Um, so it can be scientific or it can be more business and military related. So on the scientific side, you can have people like astronauts um, going to the moon. So over here you have Mae Jemison, the first female black astronaut in space who flew on the space shuttle back in the 80s. So, you know, really have a lot of respect for her. Um, so that's, but that's just one astronaut. So then you also have people going to the moon back in the 60s and 70s, um, had people going to the International Space Station. Um, and the reason those people are going to space is to conduct experiments, right? To learn about those places and environments. Um, you go to the moon, collect some rocks. Now we know what the moon is for sure made of, and it's not cheese, disappointingly, I know. So, and then you have people going to the International Space Station, living in space. This is the International Space Station right here. Um, you wouldn't really be able to tell from the scale of this, but that's about the size of a football field in length. Um, so about 100 yards. Um, people go and they live there for six months up to one year at a time just to kind of conduct some studies on what, you know, space flight does to people's bodies. Um, and then also you know, be there to run some other experiments as well, growing plants in space, um, growing organs in space. That's something really cool that's going on. Um, so yeah, that's really exciting. That's been in space since 2000 and it's been continuously inhabited the entire time. So for 20 years now, there's been somebody living and working in space continuously. Not the same person. They switch out every, I don't know, six months or so, three-person crews, um, or six-person crews, but they switch out in three. That's a little confusing, but it's really, really exciting. Um, so that's kind of on the people side. That's what we have in space, and that's kind of what they're doing. That's why they're there. That's where they're going. Um, but then, you know, another whole aspect of it is telescopes, right? So maybe some of you have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. That's this right here very famous, very important, very high power space telescope. Now, this is probably about the size of a school bus. Again, you wouldn't really be able to tell from this photo because there's nothing for scale, but it's about the size of a school bus. And then I'm gonna kind of, you know, fast forward real quick. I'm gonna come back to the slide, but here are some pictures taken from Hubble. Um, so over here, you have the pillars of creation, really famous, famous picture of outer space with a, a nebula. Then over here, you have another famous gas formation out in space. You might recognize this. Um, if any of you guys have watched Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson, they feature this, I believe, heavily in some of the artwork for the series. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about, you know, these things. This is kind of more in the realm of astrophysics, which if you tune in next week, a week from now, um, Justin from Georgia State University, also through Georgia Space Grant, is going to be talking about these sorts of things, black holes, constellations. I'll, I'll leave that up to him. I don't want to steal his thunder, but just a preview. I just threw these up here because I found it can be really, I know, really inspiring to see like what's out there, what we're able to capture. Um, so I think that's really cool. And then another thing, Hubble isn't just you. This is more visual aided. Um, so Hubble can do other things as well. That's the, I think that's the main thing, the visual telescope. But there are other versions of the same picture out there kind of modified to kind of bring out some more parts of the spectrum. So that's really cool as well. It does some actual, some really cool science. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the telescopes that are out in space. But then you have science experiments and that kind of ties in with, you know, maybe it could have something to do with people or astronauts, but in other times it doesn't, right? Yeah, Dylan, I see you down there. You've got Target. So I threw Target up here, um, you know, kind of want to support the home team, Georgia Tech, in making um, CubeSats, right? So you can see the Georgia Tech Space System Design Laboratory. Um, that's a group of students um, here at Tech, you know, undergrad students like myself, 
And then also grad students as well who are building CubeSats and sending them up to space to fulfill missions and do science. I'm not exactly sure what Target does, to be honest. But it's, it seems like we have people in the audience who know about Target. So Dylan, if you want to throw some um, Target information out in the chat, that would definitely be appreciated. Um, and just for perspective, this is so this would be considered a CubeSat. Um, and then ooh, the payload that we sent up in our rocket, this one right here last year, is a 3U CubeSat. So that's three cubes put together to make a long rectangular prism, right? So this is kind of one of these would be one U, then that would be two U, and this whole thing is three U. So this is kind of the scale of CubeSats. You can see that's kind of the square size right there. Throw that back to the side. Cool. Um, so that's kind of on the science experiment side. So then for kind of more on the business and military side, um, you can have communications, right? Communication satellites, so that's what uh, this is right here. It's just a generic communication satellite um, or artwork, art rendition of it that I pulled off of the internet. Um, you know, that's responsible for satellite phone, you know, TV is really cool, all that sort of stuff. All those really cool, um, you know, innovations that have come forward only since we've been able to get to space. Um, it's really opened up the whole world. And then something that's really cool, just to kind of um, talk about some current events going on with communication satellites. There are, you know, tons of endeavors out there to kind of make, you know, internet available for the whole world, right? And so that's going to be through putting satellites up, and that's a company, SpaceX, doing that. So shout out to Casey and Trent working there, um, and maybe like tangentially helping out with that and what they're doing. So, and then, yeah, just kind of the last thing is GPS. You know, you guys all love, you know, getting on your phone and using Google Maps. That's completely through. Um, GPS, those are through satellites, um, whether it's GPS or some of the other. Um, so GPS is the American version, maybe some of the like GLONASS, Copernicus, and the other systems. Um, but that's all kind of really similar in all space space. So that's the kind of stuff that these rockets are taking to space. Really essential stuff um, that we love to have up there that's making our lives way easier, way better. Um, and it's only going to get better from here. And then I'm seeing that Dylan said in the chat over here, um, talking about Target, he said the primary objective of Target, oh, you guys can all see this, I don't know why I'm reading it to you, but I'm gonna read it anyway. Um, the primary objective is to test the LiDAR imaging system for use on planetary probes, but it also includes side experiments about deorbiting capabilities and testing high-tech GTRI solar panels. Wow, okay, that's awesome. I kind of knew a little bit about the LiDAR, but I didn't know about the, all the side experiments, so that's really cool. It seems like a very dense experiment. Love to see that. Cool. So now we're gonna go on past this. And so if you're going to talk about payloads, you should kind of talk about where they go, right? Um, and so I kind of included this little graph right here. So here's the Earth. And then if you go up from there, you can see different orbits, right? So what does it mean to orbit? Like if I take my phone and I throw it, I'm not going to throw it, but if I threw it before it hit the ground, it'd be in a very, 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 very small suborbital orbit, right? That might sound really weird. But say I threw it really fast, like 17,000 miles per hour fast, right? Then it would be so fast that before it fell down back to the Earth, it was able to go, like, fall kind of in front of or around the Earth, if that makes sense. Um, so that's basically what an orbit is. It's just moving around the Earth. Um, you're going so fast that gravity can't pull you back down. Um, and then so some common orbits that we see out there. Um, so you have LEO, or Low Earth Orbit. So that's going to be kind of where the, where the International Space Station is. And that's going to be up to 1,200 miles. I want to say the space station is around like 250 miles. But LEO is very all-encompassing of you know, 1,200 and below. And just kind of for perspective, that's like 170 times higher than airplanes go. And when I say airplanes, again, airplanes could be anywhere from like zero to, I don't know, 100,000 feet maybe. You're extreme. Um, when I say airplanes, I'm talking about like commercial jetliners. You know, when you get on your Delta airliner and you're at 35,000 feet, you know, cruising altitude, that's about 100. And the, the upper limit of that is about 170 times higher than, you know, where you're, where you're going to be. So, but yeah. Uh, so then another common one um, is geosynchronous orbit. This is quite higher, 22,000 miles. Is, and this is a little bit, that's, you know, about 22,000 miles. That's a little bit more 
precise, right? Because low Earth orbit is kind of that upper cap and everything below it. But geosynchronous orbit is a special kind of orbit where it has to be at that 22,000 mark, right? And the reason for that is so if you think about being in orbit, right? You're spinning around the Earth at a certain rate. The Earth is also spinning, as we all know, night and day. Appreciate that. Um, there becomes a certain point in the orbit where the Earth is turning. And I don't know, I have globes off screen. I should have incorporated those. Didn't think about it. So the Earth is turning, but then you're also turning in space. And you're turning at the same rate, right? So that would be a geosynchronous orbit. And that means you're going to stay relatively right above a, a given point on the Earth the entire time. And that's really useful for uh, communication satellites, um, TV stations, for example. You can take your satellite and point it, or your, your satellite dish on the ground and point it up at that satellite in space. And then that's, that satellite in space isn't really going to move a whole lot relative to the ground. So you can just keep that up, you can beam it there, and then that satellite can beam it all around the world to other geosynchronous satellites. Um, so that's really the cool thing about geosynchronous, or in this, it's called geostationary. That's a little more easy to understand, I guess, geostationary, because you're stationary relative to the Earth. And then again, that's 1,200 times higher than airplanes. So I think at that point, you get the whole comparison starts to kind of fall apart, because how can you conceptualize, conceptualize that much higher than airplanes? But I decided, I thought I'd still throw it in. So that's where some payloads go. Um, and then, of course, they go, you know, they go to the moon. They go to Mars, they go beyond that, Jupiter, Saturn, you know, the sun, outside of our solar system, all over the place. Um, but the moon is a really cool one because people have walked on that. We're actually planning to go back to that kind of soon. So quick question for you guys. And then I haven't really decided how we're going to do this yet. Maybe I'll pose the question, give you guys a couple minutes to kind of submit your answers in the chat for those people that are, you know, active. And then, yeah, that's what we'll do. So here's the question. How far away is the moon? What do you think? Post your answers in the chat, A, B, C, D. I'll wait a couple minutes, and then I'll start to kind of reveal the answers and talk about it. So yeah, I'm going to get a sip of water. And again, we're kind of testing this out. Um, with how much the lag is, this might feel kind of awkward. Um, so I don't really know exactly how much the lag is. Um, but we're just going to kind of mess around with it, see how this kind of works. Um, but yeah. And then I appreciate all of you, know, you guys being here to kind of stick with us through this kind of new thing we're trying. Um, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going pretty well so far. So Dylan says D. Alyssa says D. OK. The Ds are winning. Garrett also says D. Oh, no. I'll give you a couple more minutes to let those answers trickle in. Cool. All right, looks like right now it's only it's only D. Does anybody have any other any other uh, Options they want to say, I'm going to throw out. I guess it's just D. All right, so now we're going to kind of move on. I'll go ahead and start kind of revealing the answers. So, oh, let me make sure I'm on this tab. All right, it's not 500. Not, thank you for nobody saying A. Appreciate that. Oh, we got another D. Awesome. We got 500,000 miles. It's a little too far. Then it's between, oh, I guess I just kind of gave it away. So it's a million, 250,000 miles, right? So yes, you guys who said D are right. That wasn't a very tricky question. So I'm proud of you guys. Um, but yeah, the moon is 250,000 miles away. That is insane. Cool, good job. So now we're going to keep going. So just real quick, I want to remind everybody that if you would like to submit questions, um, you can go through the Georgia Space Grant social media 
right here, wherever you heard about this live stream. With the exception of Slack, I'm not going to be checking Slack for questions to the people who came here through the Slack. Um, you can email them to me. You can post in the chat on here, and I'll I'll throw them out. I am going to wait until the end to answer any questions, just because of kind of the lag that we have here. Um, but feel free to kind of send them in the entire time, and then I'm going to keep moving on. Cool. So okay, now that brings us to the next part, right? So again, we just talked about the payload, right? Why is it going somewhere? Now we're going to talk about how does it know where it's going, right? Um, and so I guess I should mention the payload for the, the Saturn V, the Apollo missions, was you know taking people to the moon, right? So you had the people in here, a little capsule that would, or lander that would land on the moon. Um, so that was the that would be the payload for this, right? And then other cases, it would be um, the Skylab um, space station that went up for a couple of years back in the 70s, as well as the Apollo, the Apollo module that was part of the Apollo Soyuz mission. So a, a great um, international cooperation there. Um, but yeah, so now we're going to talk about controls, which is going to be where this black ring is on the Saturn V. Oh. Well, Saturn V has crashed. I'm not going to be using this anymore. <laughs> cool. OK, so we're going to move on. We're going to talk about controls now. But I've lost the use of my, <laughs> my visual aid, so that's, that's not fun. Anyway, OK, so what are controls, right? Um, what I kind of mean when I'm talking about controls is going to be kind of the computers that control the rocket, right? Yes, you have the more, um, you know, the things that actually control the rocket, like maybe like gimbaled engines or the fins, the canards that move or anything like that. But we're going to be talking more about like the computers and the, the power. I'm not going to go super in depth on them um, because uh, I'm seeing the uh, Fs in the chat now. So that's very, uh, yeah. yep. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so yeah, we're going to be talking about. Um, computers, kind of. So I just want to see, okay, so you can kind of see on the screen here, so something that might kind of be appropriate for a rocket of this size. This isn't what we actually use, but, you know, this is kind of on the same scale of um, computers you'd use for a rocket like this. And that'd be something like this, right? So if you can kind of see, you can kind of put it next to my face for scale, have an, an off-brand Arduino right here, and we have a Raspberry Pi. So probably more the Arduino than the Raspberry Pi. But these are just kind of small computers that you can use to control the different events that happen in rockets, right? Um, so yeah, they allow ground communication with the rocket. Um, they keep the rocket on course. So if the rocket is going somewhere where it's not going to go, the people on the ground can say, OK, let's stop that. You know, Let's make this not happen. Um, in some cases, that might include self-destructing the rocket. Um, and then another kind of comparison I want to make over here. So this is the IBM computer um, that control the space shuttle. Um, nice, Barbara. Got it exact. Very good. Um, so this is the computer that controlled the, the space shuttle right here. So this is an IBM computer. You can kind of see. Um, so that's for the space shuttle. That flew from the 80s up until 2010, 11. Um, this would be for something kind of like this behind me, or like this is this year's rocket. I didn't really talk too much about that. Um, but so that'd be something like that from the space shuttle. So then this would be for the Saturn V, right? And I don't know where it went in the you know catastrophe that just happened. So I can't keep you know using that as a reference, but that little black ring I was referencing was the um, instrument unit on the Saturn V. And that had anything from, um, you know, gimbals, so it could keep a constant coordinate axis, know where it's going, um, communications equipment, sensors, everything on the rocket, you need to know how it works. And so something that's really interesting to say here is, so this is the instrument unit that was probably primarily used from 1967 to 1972, 74. Um, so that was probably, you know, that was about 50 years ago. Um, 
And you can see how big that is. You can see for scale, there's what I'm assuming is a normal sized human male right here. And then you can see the instrument unit here. It's actually the whole diameter of the rocket right there. So, and then here's another, what I'm assuming is normal sized human male over here. So for scale, and then an iPhone. And this is not to scale. This iPhone is not, you know, towering over these people. The iPhone is just normal iPhone, you know, size of my iPhone. So it's really interesting to think about who would win um, in, you know, kind of a computer power um, terms, right? And so you think about a phone versus a whole rocket, right? Um, and so kind of think, I don't think, you know, this is going to fool a whole lot of people. But obviously, or maybe not obviously, sorry, the iPhone is going to win. Just because it's been so long, we've had so many advances in computer power over the last 50 years. Um, but what's really interesting is how much better is it, right? Um, so again, we'll kind of do a quick you know, Q&A here. I'll let kind of the first answers trickle in, and then I'll kind of give it away. But how much? stronger are we talking here in terms of processing power right so 10 times 100 times 100,000 times 35,000 times what do you guys think let me know in the chat um so casey wilson asks what is what us what us gimbal what is gimbal so um to my understanding you know my expertise as of yet is not necessarily in dynamics and controls which is why this section is kind of short relative to the other sections. Um, but a gimbal is kind of something that it maintains a constant um, orientation in space. So the rocket is able to kind of, for a rocket to be out in space where there isn't, you know, necessarily an up, down, left, right, um, it needs to have some kind of reference so it can position itself, right? And so there's some, sometimes you could use the stars because um, those are going to be constant. And astronauts did do that. Um, but in other times, you can use a gimbal as well. That might not be a fantastic answer. If anybody in the chat happens to know more about gimbals, feel free to correct me. That's just my limited understanding. Um, so it seems like the first answers are trickling in. Um, we have Ethan saying C. Dylan and Liliana slash person who introduced herself as Deborah earlier says D. So that's interesting. Let's let's see what happens. I'm gonna go ahead and start giving away the results now. So, okay, it's not A. I think you know everybody kind of kind of guessed that, so that's good. It's not B. Oh, who's it gonna be? Is it gonna be Dylan or Ethan or Dylan and Deborah or Ethan? So is it a hundred thousand times stronger or is it thirty-five thousand times stronger? And it's actually C. So yeah, an iPhone is a hundred thousand times stronger faster, able to carry out more calculations and instructions than this huge monstrosity of an instrument unit that was uh, flown 50 years ago. You might even say it's an absolute instrument unit. So yeah, yeah, cool. OK. And then again, yeah, like I said, this is just in terms of processing power, kind of what it's able to carry out, the calculations it's able to do. Um, so cool. So now we're going to kind of move on. So now we're going to talk about propulsion. How does it go? Um, so one surviving piece of the, oh, actually, this section survived from the catastrophe. And this is the first stage of the Saturn V. Um, so I guess it's kind of convenient that it actually happened like that. Because here is the propulsion section, right? Um, so you have five F1 engines down here. Um, on the Saturn V, they each produced 1.5 million pounds of thrust. And there's five of them, so that adds up to 7.5 million pounds of thrust. Um, so yeah, very big engines, never before seen for this program. And I don't think there's any engines quite as big, really operational since. I think there are probably some, you know, up and coming ones, but none of them are really really flown yet. So that's pretty crazy. But yeah, so this is how it moves, right? How does it go? So let's talk about that. Um, so kind of break it down into the four main types of propulsion you can get. 
Um, so you have solid rocket motors that have liquid rocket engines, um, hybrid propulsion or ion propulsion. So when I say solids, that just means, and this right here is a solid rocket motor that was actually built by the rocket team that I was talking about earlier to fly in this rocket right here. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, so that just burns kind of a flammable rubber inside of a metal tube at a very high pressure and is able to exhaust the gases out the back of the nozzle and kind of direct the flow in that way. Or really the difference is how they create the flow not necessarily how they direct the flow. Um, but cool. So then you have liquid rocket engines. This is a liquid rocket engine right here, SpaceX liquid rocket engine. I believe that's the Raptor, but I could be wrong. Um, again, if Casey in the chat wants to correct me because he's working in SpaceX, go for it. Um, cool. And then you could have liquid rocket engines, I guess I should say. They, so while you have a flammable rubber over here, liquid rocket engines, as the name suggests, use liquids to produce thrust, right? Um, and that is arguably, or actually probably inarguably more complicated than solids. Um, so while a student team is able to build this in the course of a year, liquids take a lot, a lot longer. So kind of, if, if you mix the two, you can get hybrid propulsion, right? So then you have one part of the rockets, a flammable rubber, and one part is a, um, it's a liquid. I'm not gonna go in too far into like the specifics of the difference right, right just yet, but I will go ahead and say it's, you know, in solid rocket motors, you combine your fuel and oxidizer into the rubber. And this, your fuel and oxidizer is both liquid, but in this you have, the rubber is often um, it's often fuel, and then your I think I have this the correct way. Your rubber is no, that's that's incorrect. Your fuel is oxidized, or your, your rubber is oxidizer, and your liquid is fuel. But I'll get kind of more into fuel and oxidizer later. Did I have that correct? I don't know. I don't remember. I've never built a hybrid rocket yet, so. Um, but yeah, so then ion propulsion, there are some great labs on campus with Dr. Walker and Maggie Stewart and Matt Corrado, some of my friends working on ion propulsion and the high power electron propulsion lab. So those are really cool. Um, but cool. So we're going to kind of talk about propulsion in kind of the three different levels, right? So we don't really know what the audience for this is going into it. So we're just going to kind of talk about it from like the very, very basics up to um, up to kind of the more advanced stuff. So if you think about a balloon, right? Or sorry, let's, let's backtrack a little. So this is a rocket flying Falcon Heavy, again, from SpaceX. Um, it's making this, this gas right here, and that's propelling it forward. But how does that happen? It's a big question. So imagine you have a balloon, right? Like this balloon right here. And then, so that's kind of similar to or analogous to the rocket just sitting on the pad, right? Just kind of chilling out there. It has all that potential, um, but it hasn't unleashed it yet. It hasn't done anything useful with it. Um, so, and then from there, you know, there, there are kind of two ways that you could re potentially release that energy in that balloon or rocket, right? So you could pop the balloon, that blow up the rocket. That would be catastrophic. Um, I do want to point out that nobody was harmed in this explosion that I'm showing right here. That was a uncrewed commercial vessel um, from 2014. Um, but that's kind of that's releasing all of its energy all at once, right? Just like popping a balloon. Um, and then another way you can release that energy is to kind of more you'll see with this person's hand down here, they're kind of directing the energy, right? Or you know, they'll let go of it and it'll fly around, but it's not um, it's not going all at once. It's able to kind of use some of that energy. Um, cool. And that would be kind of analogous to a rocket successfully taking off, you know, channeling that flow to do what it will, right? Similar to this electron rocket from Rocket Lab, or again, SpaceX's Falcon Heavy. And my Saturn V until I broke it. Cool. So let's kind of talk about, oops, let's kind of talk about kind of maybe some of the, intermediate stages and it's talking about rocket propulsion, right? So you might notice that um, 
very hot, right? It's very, it looks very hot. looks like a big flame. This looks like a big flame. So how kind of rockets are able to speed the gas up, right? Is essentially by the help of chemical reaction. And I kind of touched on this earlier when I was talking about hybrids, you know, fuel and oxidizer. But if you think about um, a campfire, right? It's a chemical reaction, just like in a rocket motor. It has oxidizer all around in the air, and it has fuel right here, you know, in, in the wood. So that is that chemical reaction. Now, in the case of a rocket, um, you're going to have, you know, the fuel and the oxidizer is both self-contained in the rocket, right? Um, they have to carry the um, fuel and oxidizer with them because they're in space. There's no oxidizer like the air right here. So they have to carry that with them. Um, but then, so that's one principle that's really important when it comes to rocket propulsion is the chemical reaction going on with fuel and oxidizer. And then another really important principle is conservation of momentum, right? So if you think about, think back to that balloon or any rocket you've seen fly, um, it's ejecting something out the back, right? In the case of the balloon, it's just shooting air out or um, maybe helium, whatever you have in your balloons. And in the case of the rocket, it's shooting out whatever exhaust gases it's going to have. And due to the conservation of momentum, you know, it's ejecting mass one way, the rest of the rocket has to gain some velocity. And that's actually how rockets are able to move. And that applies in, on Earth and space. Um, and without that principle, I don't think rockets would work super well. So yeah, that's another really important principle right there. And so really quick, I'm going to kind of talk about kind of the more advanced stuff. And I'm not going to get too into it because then at this level, you know, it does start to kind of get on the edge of what I know. But I do kind of want to just throw this stuff out there um, to make people aware of it and kind of let you know where you can find more resources. Um, so when it gets to kind of the advanced level, right, um, like I said, fuel and oxidizer are mixed. But then something that allows them to go even the flow to go even faster, right? Because if you think back to over here, the faster that the faster it's going, the more you're going to get out of it, right? And you can see that here as well in the thrust equation. So the bigger this is, the more you're going to get. Um, kind of how they're able to do that is by constricting this throat right here. You can see it's labeled throat and the nozzle. Um, and then here is an F1 engine, like I showed on the Saturn V, with its huge nozzle. You can see it kind of has a constriction there. This has a constriction. Um, this is part of the Space for America Cup team's um, motor assembly. This isn't actually the entire nozzle, so that you don't really see a defined throat in this, but you do see it's part of the nozzle. You can see it's expanding. So you want to you want to constrict it and then expand it, and that's going to accelerate the flow. And this gets into some really advanced uh, thermodynamics and other stuff about rocketry. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you guys how far it can go when it comes to, you know, you start off talking about balloons and then you end up talking about like thermodynamics and all that stuff that's very necessary to make things actually happen. So yeah, very cool. Um, cool, so another thing that I kind of threw in here last minute um, is, you know, we live in an age where I can sit at home on my computer and, you know, talk to you guys about rockets, right? But, you know, a hundred years ago-ish, when some of the first actual rockets, you know, liquid rocket engines were being flown, how did they figure all this stuff out? And in the 60s, how did they build, you know, something like the Saturn V? Um, it's really interesting. Um, and I just want to talk about some tools that, are, that were made things a lot easier for them. So, you know, if today, if I need to calculate something, anything, I'm just use my handy dandy calculator, right? You know, it'll give me any trig, you know, trig stuff you know, long division, anything, right? Um, and it, the click of a button, so fast. And I have it on my phone too, literally anywhere. But something that I think is really cool is that these people built rockets like the Saturn V. They didn't have phones, you know, calculators like we would think of today. A lot of their calculations were done on slide rules. And that's what this is right here. And it looks like the display is kind of washing out the numbers on it, but I'll kind of get it kind of close. And you can see, it just has tons of numbers and relations on this. And this is how engineers would kind of do calculations like that. I don't really want to go into the weeds of it, um, but I just kind of want to point it out. And, you know, 
think about how easy it is for, for us to do stuff these days, right? Um, and then when we go to model stuff, we could just use like a CAD software. That's really easy. But, and I think, well, you know, this is kind of easier to have an appreciation of, but back then it was, you know, you just use something like this, you know, a compass just to kind of draw stuff. And so that's, that's really crazy. Um, and today we just click a button, click a mouse, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. So now I'm going to go back to the question slide. Um, submit any questions you want. Any you know feedback or advice about this process is greatly appreciated. This is the first time we've done this. Um, you can post it in the chat, email it to me, go through Space Grant. Um, I'm going to start looking at questions that Space Grant people have sent me um, so I can start to answer some questions. Alyssa is telling me to tell Zane Earl hi. Hi, Zane. Glad you joined. Um, Happy to talk to you about rockets. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, you know, to post them or anything. Um, if you want to get more involved with rocketry, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, just a quick shout out for Zane. Um, so cool. That's one question. Let me go back over here to answer another question. So Sabina is asking, how can I get involved with rocketry-related research at Georgia Tech? Oh man, that's a big question, right? So it really depends what you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in solid rocket motors, right now the best place to be would be, you know, the Georgia Tech Space Force America Cup team, to my knowledge, we're the only ones doing that sort of stuff. Um, if you're interested in ion propulsion, um, so that is rocket-related to some extent. Um, then you'd want to join the High Power Electronic Propulsion Lab with Dr. Walker. Um, if you're interested in liquid propulsion, um, there are some other teams on campus who are doing some liquid stuff. Um, so yeah, just, and if you don't know, it doesn't hurt to just you know talk to somebody who's in one of those groups, um, talk to them. Or you know another option, kind of maybe kind of what you're looking for since you use the word research, is there is some rocketry related research going on other than the ion thruster that Dr. Walker is doing over in the combustion lab. So reach out to those professors, reach out to students there, um, you know, try to find out how you can ask them, how you can get involved. I haven't done a whole lot of research with them, so I, you know, I couldn't really tell you how to connect with them, but that'd be a really great first step to kind of talk to teachers, or sorry, professors over in the combustion lab, find out what they're doing, how can you help, how can you get involved? Um, I think most of them are pretty receptive to, to students. Um, Cool. So that's one question. Now I'm going to kind of scroll back up in the chat over here and address some other questions. So Georgia Tech Aerospace Engineering, hi Kelsey, has said, what made you want to join the Spaceport America Cup slash Ramblin' Rocket Club? So that's, you know, again, another big question. And I think it kind of talks about what I touched on in the beginning of my um, presentation. Um, so it was really just because I knew that would be a very concentrated place to learn about rockets, to put my hands on rockets, right? Like, and you can see behind me, there's rockets in my room. That's, you know, completely because I was part of this club. Um, and these aren't, I just want to really stress, like these aren't my rockets. They're the team's rockets that I'm borrowing. These are both massive group efforts. Um, so don't point that out. Um, but yeah, I just, it was just to like, get my hands on for some rockets, learn about rockets, meet people that are also passionate about rockets. Um, all those four reasons, that's really what got me interested. And how I found out about it was I wanna say probably social media or, no, I was actually at the org fair at Facet, which is kind of the introductory thing for freshmen to go to. Um, so I found out about that, got really excited. Then this team started, I was really excited about it still. So yeah, that's kind of my, how I went from you know random freshmen to doing rocket things. Cool. Um, but yeah, cool. Um, then Georgia Tech Aerospace Engineering again is asking, again, hey Kelsey, who in the aerospace world do you look up to? So I think it's kind of important to, you know, make a distinction between like looking up to people you know and people you don't know, right? So 
you know, I just finished a Werner von Braun biography recently. And that was, you know, I definitely look up to him. He was, you know, part of the genius behind what got people to the moon, a large part of it, right? Um, had a big deal and developing a lot of the initial, you know, missiles and rockets back in the 50s and 60s and kind of being like a champion of space travel and research back in the day when it was, you know, brand new, unheard of. So him kind of holistically, I really, you know, look up to for his engineering expertise and his ability to kind of talk to people about space and rocketry and really get people passionate about it. I really um, look up to that. Um, so that's one. Haven't met Werner von Braun, unfortunately, never will. Um, but then there's other people, you know, that I look up to in the aerospace world, right? Like people that I know that have taught me, right? So I'd say you can have some people like like Casey that I've referenced a couple times, you know, like people, you know, he's he taught me a lot in my time at the Rocket Club about rocketry and stuff. Um, and then you'd also have people like other mentors of mine throughout, like, you know, maybe um, Matthew Chicky. He taught me a lot of stuff. I um, really appreciate him. And then I also look up to a lot of my kind of peers, right? Like it's really cool to see other people working hard on rockets and being really passionate about rockets. Um, or aerospace in general and helping people out. So I definitely, you know, I look up to those aspects of just you know, my peers or generally anybody as well. Um, and then we have another question. Will there be another flight to space in the future? Yes, definitely. So it I, as of, you know, my last checking this, there should be a launch to the space station um, in May. I believe, again, if that is incorrect, somebody in the chat, correct me. But so that's going to be people going to low Earth orbit the space station in May, next month. What a lot of people don't realize is that people are still going to space. And I said earlier that the space station is continuously inhabited um, and that people, so people are going to space all the time. Throughout those 20 years, you have people going to space all the time. So that's really awesome. Um, but I get the sense that you kind of mean like bigger picture, right? Um, so NASA's goal right now, as of again, the last I've heard is 2024, they wanna send people to the moon, or sorry, yeah, down the moon, kind of set up a base there, kind of go back to the moon, establish like a little, a little base, that sort of stuff. Um, so, and then from there, go off to Mars. Um, so yeah, yes, people are going to space, it's still going on. Um, how we're gonna how we can get more people in space is getting people excited about space. So I guess kind of what I'm doing right now, I'll talk to people about space. Um, but yeah, people are definitely still going to space. People will keep going to space, hopefully. And right now it's just low Earth orbit, but it will be Moon and Mars in the coming decade or so. Fingers crossed. Um, and then I had another question from Alyssa with Space Grant. Um, will the Saturn V I dropped be recoverable? Yes. Huh, yeah, it's it's fine. It's Lego. So that's a good thing. It's not like, you know, an actual scale model or anything like that. So it's Lego, you know, I can put it back together, which will actually kind of be fun. Give me something to do um, and put it back together, fix it up. Yeah, it'll be totally fine. Um, I, I kind of suspected that was going to happen like midway through, but who knows? It was funny. You know, no regrets. It'll be easy to fix. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, if anybody has any more questions, now is definitely the time to send them. Um, or say, you know, sign off, say farewell, then I'll know this is over. Um, but I had a great time doing this. Um, again, any feedback you guys have, post it down in the chat below. Because um, like I said, this is the first time we've been doing this and we definitely want to keep doing more of these um, with, you know, not just me, other speakers as well. Justin next week talking about really cool astrophysics stuff. So tune in for that. Um, but yeah, just any advice or, you know, feedback you guys have about how this went would be really helpful. Um, and yeah, so thank you guys. Unless, you know, I see any more questions. I know there's a lot of lag, so I'll kind of, you know, wait. Um, okay, so we got another question coming in from Maria Brandon. Mariah, maybe, sorry. Um, what sensors were in the rocket we built? So she's talking about you know, this rocket back here and then what would have been... Um, this rocket right here, right? So there's a whole array of sensors we have in there from accelerometers to sense, you know, the G forces that are going on, um, the acceleration that the rocket is sensing at any given time. Um, and then we also have, you know, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pressure sensors, barometers. Oh, oh altimeters is more what I'm looking for because that works through pressure. So you have altimeters. Those you can see, maybe you can see in this in the rocket, you actually have holes poked in the rocket to allow you know outside air to get in there, and that works through uh, the altimeter senses the pressure of the air around it, and that that gets in through those holes. And then based off of that pressure, it's able to kind of say, this is the altitude that the rocket's at. So that's actually kind of how we get scored um, in competition, because it's an altitude competition. So we have to present our results from our rocket to get our altitude. Um, we also have timers. I, I would say those are the two main sensors, um, accelerometers, um, barometers, or altimeters, sorry. Um, oh, Brophy's talking about Kate. So this year on our rocket, we have the Kate, which is a treat that we were able to purchase um, with our SGA funds. The rocket team is funded by the Student Government Association here. And that's, it's like a fully integrated, it's like this big, the size of like a Hershey bar. It's got all the different functions you could want. You know, it's got multiple channels and it speaks to you and like all this crazy stuff. It's like luxury rocket electronics. It's probably like, about the size of this, but like this long. So it's that's really awesome. Thanks for reminding me about that, Brophy. That's gonna that is gonna be on this rocket right here that was supposed to launch this summer, but is now gonna be launching in the fall sometime. Um, but as far as just kind of sensors in general, yeah, uh, or altimeters, uh, accelerometers. We have timers on there to kind of manage some of the different events we have, and then we have some onboard like logic computers as well that'll take in. Um, oh, we also have a um, GPS on there that will allow us to find the rocket afterwards. I guess you can consider that a sensor. Um, and then a flight computer as well that will kind of sense the orientation of the rocket. So, but yeah. Casey asks, why does the rocket have two tails on it? Uh, I don't know what a tail is, but I'm guessing he means like fins. Um, and maybe he's getting at that I never mentioned that this rocket is a two-stage rocket. Is that what you mean, Casey? I don't really, I'm not really picking it up. So, or he maybe means like the dual fins right there. I'm not really picking it up. I think he means, he's trying to get me to say that the rocket is a two-stage rocket. because That's something that we're really excited about and proud of, um, but yeah, two tails. Not exactly familiar with that terminology, Casey. Hmm. Okay, so Shaquem asks, how do you make the rocket start to get to the moon? So um, I think you mean, like, so how do you actually start the rocket, right? Um, so that would be like with an ignition sequence. And for us and our motors, um, we have a system for that that includes kind of basically just like you have these things called E-matches um, that will... You, when you run a, an electric current through them, they'll, they'll pop and produce a little bit, like a little spark. So you can use something like that with some, you know, propellant powder, almost like gun, not really gunpowder, um, slower burning to kind of, you know, get it really hot. And make So you basically make a little fire inside of the solid rocket motor that we made, and then that'll ignite, right? Um, so that's how we do it. It's relatively, you know, compared to bigger rockets, it's not as complicated, right? Um, but you know, other rockets like the Saturn V, for example, I actually read today, I'm reading a book about the Saturn V and I read the ignition sequence. And so our ignition sequence is, I don't know, one step, ignite the E-match. Saturn V ignition sequence for the first stage is like 20 steps long. So um, that includes, you know, opening valves, getting turbines running, you know, sensing certain pressures and opening valves, all sort of, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, that's how you kind of start the rockets. Um, in our case, it's a little E-match, and there, and you know, bigger rockets cases, it's a little more complicated. You get into like, you know, hypergolic slugs, and which is just like a little fluid that you put into the mixture that kind of automatically burns and gets everything burning. Um, so you could do something like that, or like pyrotechnic igniters. That's kind of basically what we do, but you can also do it on liquids as well. So yeah, there's a whole kind of range of things how you start the rocket. Um, so yeah, any more questions? Um, I don't really have an end time limit. Like, you know, I don't have anything to do. So if you guys have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. 
otherwise, I will close down the live stream. Um, so, but yeah, um, not seeing any more questions. So I'm like, yet. So, but I'm not going to close down yet. So I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, thanks guys for tuning in. Really appreciate it. I had a great time talking to you guys about rockets today. Um, you know, if you have any further questions that you don't think of, you know, feel free to reach out on email or anything like that. More than happy to talk to you. Um, but yeah, um, stay safe out there. You know, use hand sanitizer and wash your hands and cover your face. So, okay. So another question, Carson Dobbs asks, who is my favorite rocket scientist? It's you, Carson. Carson, you're my favorite rocket scientist because we have the same name. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, am I? No. So my, my favorite rocket scientist, like I said, because I just read his biography, currently right now is probably Werner von Braun. Um, you know, he's probably one of the famous, but I also got to hand it to like some of the earlier guys, right? Like, uh, like Robert Goddard, you know, he was making liquid rockets before anybody had ever done it before. True pioneer. Um, you know, uh, let's see, Slyovsky. I can't pr pronounce his name correctly. Um, you know, the Russian who made rocket equations back in the early 1900s. Um, that's another great pioneer that doesn't really get a whole lot of recognition. Um, well, he does, but I don't think as much as he, you know, gets. You got Hermann Oberth. Well, I think what I'm getting at here is just really like the early people who did, you know, who did it before anybody else did, you know? So I think that took a lot of like, you know, like imagine, you know, never having heard of rockets and somebody's like, hey, let's build some rockets and go to space. And you're like, what? Like they, they had to go through that and they did that. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of respect for those people. I think that's really cool. The early pioneers, like, you know, Robert Goddard, Hermann Ober, Slyolovsky, Werner von Braun, definitely. So, uh, so I'm again gonna kind of. Any more questions? Not seeing any more questions yet, um, but uh, you know they always pop up because we got some lag, which is okay. Um, All right, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to go ahead and start closing out here. Um, again, I've been Carson talking about rockets through the Georgia Space Grant Consortium. Thank you guys for watching. Had a really great time. If you have any more questions after I kind of close things out, feel free to email me um, or reach out to Space Grant on any social media. Um, but yeah, that's about, that's about all I got. Um, if you're interested in joining the rocket team, um, also feel free to reach out. We can kind of hook you up with the right people and places and stuff. So yeah, cool. Well, thank you guys very much. I had a great time. It gave me something to do on this Tuesday afternoon. Um, and yeah, stay safe out there. Um, stay healthy. Good luck with your schoolwork. I know things are strange right now, but yeah, awesome. Well, you guys have a good day and fly safe. <laughs>